man, the lighting is going to look really different between the this part of the video and what we shoot tomorrow morning, because Pokemon announcement. Oh yeah, this lighting looks nothing like yesterday afternoon. Whoops. Welcome to another weekly news wrap up video where I waited till Wednesday this week because I wanted to see what was happening at this morning's Pokemon Presents. And I gotta say, I did not see that announcement coming. See, last week we got a Pokemon Presents that had a bunch of different announcements for different Pokemon games, DLC, all that kind of good stuff, and amongst them one of the biggest surprises was the announcement of a new puzzle game called Cafe, and most importantly, we finally are getting a sequel to Pokemon Snap 2. But on top of all of that, they said, hey, we're gonna have another one of these next week with another big surprise. Now this led to speculation from people for a lot of different things like, oh, maybe we're getting an announcement of Pokemon Let's Go 2. Maybe Maybe we're getting Pokemon 4th Gen Remakes, which is probably a little ahead of the curve. Maybe it's Detective Pikachu related. Pikachu? Oh, geez. Well, it turned out to be none of those things. Instead, we got the announcement of a brand new game that the Pokemon company is working with Tencent on called Pokemon Unite, which is a MOBA. If the word MOBA means nothing to you, that's the kind of name and genre that was come up with later for games like League of Legends and Dota 2. And this looks to be a very, very simple take on that concept. But it looks like there's not quite as many additional enemies to worry about. Uh, the trailer does have a very light showing of saying that you can catch other Pokemon, and it looks like that's kind of a neutral faction that'll help you get experience. But there's not the same kind of waves of minions everywhere or towers you have to destroy to make progress. Progress. At least that's how it looks from the demo that they showed today. They really heavily focused on just players fighting other players. There's probably a lot of mechanics that haven't been fully discussed just yet. For instance, there's also no reference to any kind of item system, which could mean that they dropped it in favor of more simplistic gameplay, or they just aren't ready to talk about it quite yet. You just have your Pokemon, they level up by fighting and defeating each other, and in some cases even evolve mid-match and get new abilities and attacks as they do so. The simplicity also extends to how you score points and win. You're not trying to destroy an enemy base, you're just trying to get to the other side and claim a goalpost on the end by basically standing on it for a while. Now details on the release are still a little bit skim. We don't have a release date, but we do know the game is going to be free to start, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And it's also going to be released on both Nintendo Switch and mobile platforms, iOS and Android, and will support cross-play on all those devices, which is a nice feature. Now as for the fact that it's free to start, obviously this game is going to end up costing some kind of money, not to play, but just to be able to actually get, you know, more stuff. That's how MOBAs work. They always revolve around the concept of having to pay money to either unlock new characters, new skins, new whatever, and they didn't actually talk about that during this presentation, which I understand. They're trying to kind of just start by focusing on building hype, being like, hey, look, we're making this new Pokemon game in a genre we haven't done before, and it's free to play. And then they're going to kind of later on be like, oh, also, by the way, here's how we do plan on having you pay for stuff. It's possible that we could be paying for unlocking new Pokemon as they release. It's possible that maybe there's some kind of alternate skin ideas for some Pokemon. Maybe you could get the shiny color, and that's something that costs a little money. Uh, it could also even be something where you're not necessarily getting full-blown skins like in another, a lot of other games, but maybe you could unlock, you know, different cosmetic accessories to equip with your Pokemon. So you can have a Pikachu and a top hat or... I don't know, I'm just, I'm already trying to think of all the ways that they could end up monetizing this game because at the end of the day, that is going to be one of the big goals with releasing a MOBA game of this style with the Pokemon brand. And aside from me theorizing how they're gonna monetize it, everything else we've talked about so far is really the only stuff we know for sure about the game. This was a very short presentation, only about 15 minutes. It's actually really surprising to me that it was its own separate conference compared to the other one because this all could have easily fit in just one slightly longer show. I was really thinking that this standalone one would have been like some kind of 30 minute or, you know, kind of deep dive into something, but no, it's just a separate standalone announcement for a Pokemon MOBA, which is cool. I'm going to be honest, it feels a little late because this is a genre that while definitely popular, it feels like everyone tried tossing their hat into the ring, you know, in like the mid 2010s, a little earlier than that. And it kind of died off in preference for people now trying to make a lot of different, you know, objective shooters. But instead, Pokemon is trying their hand at it now in 2020. And the thing is, 
Even though it feels a little bit late, I would not be shocked if this ends up actually doing pretty well, because, again, it's the Pokemon franchise, so that alone brings a lot of eyes to it right away. And to top that off, it does look like a very easy introduction into the genre. So people that, you know, tried stuff like League or Dota but decided they didn't like it, whether it's because they didn't like having to deal with shop management, or they didn't like having to keep track of stuff, or they just didn't enjoy it for whatever reason, because this is such a simpler approach to that formula, might be something a little more accessible to them. What's really interesting about the timing of this announcement too is how shortly it kind of comes after an unofficial announcement from Nintendo that they're actually gonna be backing out of mobile games. Now, yes, Nintendo and the Pokemon Company are two separate things. A lot of times people like to kind of group them together because, you know, Pokemon games are on Nintendo systems, but they aren't actually that deeply connected of a company when it comes to other releases like this. Now, this whole thing about Nintendo pulling out of mobile was actually based on comments made by the president of Nintendo and was pulled by Bloomberg in an article. And the basic concept is that they just aren't really interested in pursuing it further, which makes a lot of sense for a few reasons. They started doing mobile games as a result of the Wii U performing terribly. They were trying to find a new way of making a lot of extra money. And with how successful the Switch is right now, that's not really as big of an issue as it once was. And to top that off, they just didn't do that great. It's not that there aren't necessarily fans of those games. There are a lot of people that really love the Fire Emblem mobile game. That's definitely the largest one out of all the titles they did. The Mario Runner, Mario Kart, Dragalia, none of those really hit quite as hard. The big success was definitely Fire Emblem. And even then, the amount of profit that game made wasn't quite as crazy as a lot of other mobile games out there. Now it was clarified by Nintendo's mobile partners that this is not a full stop. There are still some games on the horizon that are planned out, but it looks like those are gonna be further away than originally planned. And as those release, it's just going to be fewer and fewer until Nintendo completely stops making mobile titles and instead is just focused on their traditional home console market. In other gaming news, Summer Game Fest is still going on strong, so we've gotten quite a few game announcements from this past week, some really big, some a little smaller. I think one of the biggest ones for a lot of people, though, was the leak and very shortly after announcement of Crash Bandicoot 4. This was officially announced at Summer Game Fest this past Monday, but was leaked quite a few days before that. However, the leak really only gave us the fact that it was happening for sure and showed us the cover art. The actual announcement of it did give us a little bit of a minute long trailer that was pretty awesome looking. What is arguably just as big, if not a bigger announcement to some people, is that as part of EA's little press conference showing off a bunch of new games, including a few indie ones that look pretty interesting, but the big kind of reveal, aside from showing gameplay for Star Wars Squadron, which looked great, was the official announcement announcement that Skate 4 is happening. The only issue is, that's really all it was. Uh, given that there's a lot going on right now, there were probably plans to do some kind of bigger unveiling when, you know, COVID wasn't going on in the world, but with delays and that kind of thing, they still ended the conference by announcing that Skate 4 is in development, but we don't really have anything beyond that right now. Yesterday was also the New Game Plus Expo where a bunch of different companies got together to make their own announcements. Some of them were a little smaller, like reminders of ports that are coming out very soon. As far as new game reveals go, probably the largest ones were the confirmation of East 9 coming to PS4 and Nintendo Switch. And honestly, I think one of the most hype announcements for me this past week, even though it is such a relatively small game, is we are getting a sequel to Bloodstained Curse of the Moon. This was a spin-off game to Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. I have talked about it numerous times where it's just kind of meant to be a smaller, very retro style Castlevania adventure, and I honestly love it so much. And even though it's tied to Ritual of the Night, which is supposed to be like the big game that was kickstarted and everything, honestly, Curse of the Moon actually left a longer lasting, bigger impression on me. So really happy to see that this is getting an official sequel. And to top all of it off, one of the new playable characters is a Corgi in a mech. So really, what is there not to love? Some other game focused news that happened is that there has been an update for Horizon Forbidden West. When it was first shown off at the PS5 reveal, there wasn't really any major clarity yet about when it would be releasing, but it has now come out that the game will be coming out sometime in 2021. So not this year, not a launch title for PS5, which I think was a very ambitious thing to hope for, but 2021 is honestly a lot sooner than I was expecting. When I first saw that trailer, I really thought this was going to be a little further into the life cycle, but next year, I'll take it. This past Monday was, of course, also the reveal of new Super Smash Bros. DLC. We got confirmation of who the upcoming ARMS character is, which is Min Min. Really caught me off guard because it's actually my favorite ARMS character, and I really didn't think she was going to be the one they picked. I'm happy for it. Just a nice little pleasant surprise. But on top of that, going along with the trend of every time they reveal a new character, they also make an announcement for me costumes. The one big surprise in this time being Vault Boy from Fallout, which... 
I'm very much for. I never would have predicted that being a thing. It's a little more different because it's a mascot character that's never really been playable in anything, aside from I guess the mobile game because they're all little vault boy characters. Whatever. The point is, it is going to be a playable me costume that looks pretty awesome. Now, there was also some big stuff happening on the business side of things in the game industry this past week. I think one of the biggest surprises for a lot of people is, of course, the fact that Microsoft is dropping Mixer in favor of now partnering up with Facebook Gaming. And this came as a big surprise to pretty much everyone. The announcement came out completely out of nowhere. People who are streamers on Mixer had no idea this was happening, and it's just all kinds of a mess of a situation right now. Uh, it's really rough for people who built their audience on that platform. Hopefully they can find a new home either on this new partnership with Facebook Gaming or they can move over to Twitch or YouTube, but it's definitely a big surprise. In a clarification posted by Major Nelson later, something I think is interesting to point out is that it sounds like what they're planning on doing with Facebook Gaming is not necessarily to the same extent of what they did with Mixer. For instance, if you're an Xbox One owner, you'll know that you actually had a dedicated Mixer tab on your interface that you could go to and interact with, it sounds like they will not be doing that with Facebook Gaming. So Facebook Gaming is not going to be a part of the Xbox Series X or the Xbox One. It sounds like they're just dropping that section entirely. And speaking of Facebook from earlier, another bit of gaming news for them is that they have acquired Ready at Dawn. Now, if that name doesn't sound super familiar to you, they are a game company that is responsible for probably the biggest thing they're known for on PlayStation was Order 1886. After that, they focused more on VR games like Lone Echo, and now it looks like that's going to be the main focus of the company as they work underneath Facebook to create more content for Oculus VR. In other words, if you were hoping for any kind of sequel to Order 1886 and actually having a resolution to the plot of that game because it ended on such a ridiculous cliffhanger, that's probably not going to happen anymore. Unless maybe they make a VR game down the line, but that's still different than what. The point is, we're probably not seeing a true sequel anymore. As for game releases this week, we've got a couple re-releases as well as DLC and one kind of big release. Uh, yesterday was the release of remakes for the Star Wars Episode One Racer, which I have a lot of fond memories of from the N64, which probably hasn't actually aged super great. And the remake of SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom also was released. Today is the official release for Ninjala on the Nintendo Switch, and tomorrow we'll be getting a couple of bits of DLC, including a new expansion for Borderlands 3 coming to all the platforms it's currently out on. And Control is finally getting its first bit of DLC on the Xbox One after it's already been released on PlayStation for quite some time. Tomorrow also marks the release of the Blair Witch game making its way to the Nintendo Switch. That's it for the news this week. As always, if you guys want to see more of my thoughts and stuff going on right now, you can always follow me on Twitter at Kevin Kenson. And I'll see you guys next week with another one of these wrap-ups. Until then, see you guys later.